Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Anna, and a slight little side note. I'm absolutely rubbish when it comes to names, and that goes for people's names, it goes for songs, movies, actors, anything. So when um, the conference asked me for my kind of theme song, the only thing I could think of was this ridiculously funny video of the Swedish chef from The Bumper Show that we watched a lot when I was a kid, doing, playing the popcorn song. So search on Google and you'll find that one. Um, I'm here today to talk a bit about how we can use storytelling to kind of make better experiences overall. And the thing is, a lot of the time when we look at optimizing experiences, we look at the little things that we know that we can change. So it might be that we're testing a heading, a kind of a tagline, button, colors and text and whatnot, to different kind of form layouts. But the problem with all of that is that it kind of tends to be a lot more about trying to fix something rather than actually trying to architect something from the beginning. Jeffrey Eisenberg at Conversion Hotel last year was talking about that our role is much more akin to that of a mechanic rather than an architect. And actually, what we need to do is something completely different. We need to move to that kind of architect and engineering place where everything really, really happens for a reason. We all know that the best way to kind of deliver a product and develop a product is to work iteratively and collaboratively in an agile kind of way. And that's the best use for the teams, for budgets, timings, absolutely everything. Um, but we also know that the realities of the products that we're working on aren't always kind of that way. In a good situation, our UX designers, creatives, and developers will be working together in a really, really bad case, it might be that everyone is working in isolation and we have not an iterative approach at all, but instead something that's much more kind of siloed. I've freelanced for the last six kind of years and right now I'm focusing on helping companies who don't have a UX designer at all or who actually needs to kind of train their whole company to become more kind of UX minded. My goal is always to kind of try to be involved right at the beginning if we have a very simplified kind of project process where we start to explore and analyze everything. A lot of the time, though, however my best efforts, the companies, they have their processes in place. They have their way of working, and realistically, that means that sometimes I come in after the strategy is done, after the big kind of creative idea is done. I work a lot with marketing agencies. Um, and I kind of sit somewhere right in, in the middle. When we look at conversion rate optimization and we, kind of how we actually mesh and improve things, analytics, a lot of the time we sat down all the way down kind of at the bottom of the funnel. And that's really kind of a problem because it again enforces this whole idea that we're not out about architecting things from the beginning, but rather it's about actually fixing things and that kind of rather than kind of analyzing and measuring things. Jared talked a little bit before about we need to make sure that we're actually designing and defining the good things, and there's plenty of these, which I don't actually really like, but these kind of illustrations out there on the internet. And there are a number of issues with the fact that we have CRO, for example, all the way at the bottom of the funnel. And one thing is that we might actually try to optimize something that we might, we, maybe we shouldn't have done in the first place. Maybe we're not solving the right problem, or at least not solving the problem in kind of an appropriate way. Secondly, when we have CRA all the way down at the bottom, that tends to also be kind of symbolic for that the organization overall has some larger issues where you tend to work in those kind of silos. And those silos, if you think about it, it's actually a little bit like wearing the kind of VR headsets. The teams are in their own little world and they just see what they focus on. They see the metrics that they focus on. They see the UX that they focus on, the design, whatever it might be, the hamburger menu, they kind of really, really determined on actually having instead of kind of looking at the wider picture. And in a really bad case, there's no kind of shared vision within the teams, but there's definitely no kind of shared wish vision with the team. But actually, when you look at things, all throughout this kind of process funnel, we're all out kind of doing the same thing. We're all asking the same kind of questions and want the same kind of answers. And we should have those all the way from the beginning, all the way down to kind of the end. And in the end, it's not really about, you know, whether if changing the color of a button will make sure that conversions increases, or whether changing the text or changing the layout of a form will actually improve conversions overall. Because it's actually about making sure that we're solving the right problems for our users, 
and that we really, really understand what they need and how we can actually best deliver those in the most appropriate and the most kind of easy to use kind of way. Every single user that uses our products and services will go through a journey. And every single journey will be slightly different. We need to understand what really makes a difference to those journeys and where users are actually coming from. And for us to really understand this, we have to dig into the details and really look at the context of the users that we're designing for and the context of the experiences that they're using as well. This is where we can learn a lot from, from storytelling and actually draw from kind of traditional principles and tools from, from storytelling. Aristotle was the first one to point out that the way in which we tell a story has a raw, has a raw impact on how the human mind actually experiences that story. He had this idea back um, in 300 BC, quite a long time ago, that when he wrote a piece called Pretics, that there's seven golden rules to storytelling that needs to be there, and ideally they should be there in a kind of typical kind of order in order for that story to be the best it possibly could. The most important aspect, according to Aristotle, was the plot, and then it was the character. After that, you have the idea, um, and it, kind of the theme of everything, and then you have the speech, which kind of is the conversations between the characters or the narrator of the kind of play itself. The fifth element is the chorus. The, fifth, uh, the sixth element is the decor, which is the design in which the story actually takes place. And then you have the spectacle, which is that kind of one thing that the user will really remember. And I pulled out a couple of these today to look at how we can actually draw from these in the experience that we design. The first one is the plot. And when you look at traditional kind of storytelling, we talk about dramaturgy. Dramaturgy is all about providing a structure for the plays and the things that we're actually working with and making sure that there's a way for them to actually act it out. It provides that kind of narrative structure that we can actually perform. Aristotle, again, was the one who developed the three-act structure, where in the first act it's used for exposition. There's something at the end, something at the end of the, of the first act, which is a plot point, a turning point that ensures that life will never, ever be the same. It usually lands the main character in a much more worse situation, and the dramatic question is kind of, is kind of answer, asked, will the boy actually get the girl? In the second act, the character confronts the plot that happened at the... In the second act, the character, I'm going back one, if I can, um, the, the protagonist attempts to kind of solve the problem that he came across in the first act. And he usually lands him in an even kind of worse situation. Here is where he finds out so much more about himself, the character develops, and the kind of narrative arcs really take shape. At the end of the second act, there's a turning point that again kind of drives into the third act, and that's the kind of finale of everything, where you get the conclusion and everything, everything draws to, to an end. The dramatic question is answered. Did the boy actually get the girl? There's a lot that we can draw from these kinds of experiences and plot points and narrative structures is a way to really help shape stories. And as you saw a sneak peek of before, there's different typical kind of stories that we're dealing with as well that we can learn a lot from. In, for example, from bad to worse, things go from a really, really bad situation and then it dips all the way down to the bottom. And we can recognize these from a lot of kind of famous, famous stories, both movies, plays, and kind of fairy tales. These were developed by Kurt Vonnegut, who proposed it as a master thesis for Chicago University. But they actually rejected it because they thought, you know what, well, it's not academic enough and it seems a little bit kind of too fun. But it's a lot that we can draw from on this when we think about experiences that we are designing. Because actually, if you think about, for example, one of your experiences with United, sometimes that can actually be a, a bad situation that just goes to worse. And those things really have an impact on, on, on our products and services that we engage with and how we interact with those products and services. If you think about a typical kind of uh, user who's going to buy something, there's a massive difference if they're one of the people who've been sitting in the Apple queue and just going, oh my god, the new iPhone is coming out, I'm going to get the new iPhone. Or whether they have an iPhone that just keeps on crashing and the battery you know, runs out, or whatever that might be. That has a profound impact on that kind of experience. And it again draws us back to these kind of questions. Who are we kind of dealing with and what's the backstory to the user? If we apply the three-act structure and kind of look at the plot points to a typical purchase journey, we have the kind of act one where a user will become aware of their problems, they start to look into it, 
in the end of, um, in the, end of, of the, sec on the first act, so they start to actually consider buying it, and they go into kind of that worst situation in the second act, where they really dig in and find out whether this product is something for them. And then in the third act, they make a decision on whether they're going to buy or not. We can actually map out experiences similar to what Kurt Vonnegut did by looking at where the experience should land, either from a kind of a more, more optimal point of view before we design it, or actually as an evaluating tool afterwards as well, from hygiene factors that simply needs to be there to kind of feel good factors to delight. And we can start to actually see how that journey will feel kind of emotionally to use as well and identify certain points where there might be particular kind of barriers or particular things, drop-offs, where we know we need to do something to make sure we keep the user's attention and keep that kind of engagement throughout the whole thing. So one of the first takeaways is that we can use dramaturgy and the plot points to really help provide kind of a structure to help define and visualize the experiences that we're designing. The second point is around characters. Traditionally, in storytelling, you talk about kind of hierarchy, high character hierarchy, and how they kind of rank in relation to the importance of the story itself. The most important one is, of course, the protagonist. Without the protagonist, there wouldn't actually be kind of a story. But then you have the villains, you have the friends, you have the mentors, you have the rivals, all of who can be divided into the main, the main characters, supporting characters, subplot characters, and one-string characters. And just like typical stories have a typical shape to them, when it comes to who's most important, that tends to follow the kind of story that you're designing for as well. For example, slasher movies tend to be about who's actually the most important characters tends to be the one who survives the longest. Luckily, when it comes to experiences that we design, hopefully in most cases our users do kind of survive the whole time. But we traditionally, we're very used to thinking about users in this way. We think about the end users, the ones who are actually going to be using and interacting with our products. But increasingly, it's actually also about the different devices that we're going to be using and the role those devices are going to play in terms of the type of experience and how they're going to connect with the other devices, but also in terms of the kind of our life and how and when we're actually going to be using them. We have a growing number of connected devices like Internet of Home and Smart, smart Homes or Internet of Things and Smart Homes. And we're now at a time when we're starting to see things that we've only seen in movies before, like Minority Report, and in concept videos like A Day of Glass, and then in even more movies like Her, actually become a reality. Voice will no doubt influence and impact so many ways in which we're actually engaging with technology. But we're starting to talk to interfaces and services and products in a completely different way. And it's not just voice, it's also bots and AI and machine learning. John Underkoffler, um, who was one of the guys who was working on the kind of concept behind the Minority Report UI, he's got this whole vision where content will just flow seamlessly from one kind of pixel, as he calls it, to another. We're starting to see, even if it's kind of experimentation and concepts, but again, how even the kind of our own skin, different kind of surfaces can now become the interfaces that we're engaging with. And even if this mirror was actually developed by a former Google engineer called Max Brown, because it can actually buy a smart mirror, those things are starting to become, starting to become a reality and is <laughs> something for us to actually consider. Traditionally, these personas have been done for the kind of users, but now increasingly, it's actually about thinking about all the different types of actors that we're dealing with. When I study computer science, we spent a lot of time talking about the system as an actor. And that's increasingly what we need to do now when we have AR machine learning bots, so many different ways of engaging. But actually, it's not just about the system. It's also about the brand itself, the tone of voice, how customer service will be kind of affected when we're now actually having customer service that's being handled by, by a bot instead. A great example of this, as a kind of illustrative example, is um, healthcare and how we're seeing bots and AI being interfaces that people can talk to, for example, um, get health support or mental health support rather than actually visiting a psychiatrist. We're giving these bots some kind of personality, and that personality is something that we need to consider 
both from a toy and a voice point of view, but also in terms of what they were actually going to look like. Some cases it might be too clinical, and some might actually be too kind of fun and goofy, so we're not going to take it seriously. And those are kind of have a profound impact on how we actually, as users, engage with or kind of not engage with those products and services. So when it comes to the characters, the thing we can really learn from, from storytelling is that storytelling, kind of anything that has to do with storytelling, are so great as just thinking about every single actor and every single point in the story where their role and where their character actually plays a part. And that's what we need to do as well, have frameworks that we can define all of the different characters and the role they play, when and where, and how it's all kind of connected. The last point is the decor, so the kind of the design of the place in which the story takes place. In a good story, everything happens for a reason. There's from the music to the lighting, how all of that kind of changes. There's a reason behind absolutely everything. The caution relationships or red thread, as we talk about in Sweden, Swedish, that kind of ties it all together, that runs through it all. And if you pay really close attention to a movie or a play or a book, you can sometimes notice the, notice the little, little things. Um, <laughs> Little things, it might be an object, it might be something that someone is saying or something they're doing, and you just know intuitively that that thing is going to play a part later on in the narrative itself. Brad Falchuk, the co-creator of American Horror Story, says that generally you should have a basic idea of where the story is going, but you don't need to know who's going to die. In fact, you don't want to know that. And you don't want to know necessarily how you're going to get from New York to LA. But there should be that kind of basic idea. And the products and services that we design, there should definitely be a narrative kind of sequence and that red thread that runs through it all. But we should still let users explore content on their own way. And actually, when it comes to designing things, we should make sure that we haven't signposted absolutely everything through navigation and do that thing what we saw before, which is so many conflicting kind of call to actions and that tries to draw in our attention. The thing is, and the reality that we're actually designing for, and that kind of scene setting that we're designing for now is, is quite messy. And we no longer control the journeys at all. We no longer even control the messaging. There used to be a time where we could quite accurately predict um, how a user would engage with our products and service. They would come to the home page, and then they would kind of sequentially navigate through to the kind of end page that we wanted them to go to. Increasingly today, Google and social are our home pages, and users will land right smack in the, bin, in the middle of an experience without any other kind of context on the kind of tweet or the link that actually sent them there with the search result. Search and shopping is a great example of how complex our kind of journeys online have become and how kind of much they're jumping from one thing to another. And this is, again, something that we should consider when we look at metrics and we're analyzing the outcomes at the end and try to improve them, that just because the user's dropping off early on might not mean it's a bad thing or they're not buying, because it might be that they're just doing that kind of initial research and then coming back. Pretty much every single project that we're now working on looks a bit like this picture of Charlie just going, it's all so mental, there's so many different things that we need to consider. But that's actually a really, really good thing. And it doesn't mean that we can just lean back and just go, you know what? There's just too many different antipoints, too many different touch points. It's not even worth actually mapping it out. It's rather the opposite. We need to really map it out. We re need to really understand the context that we're designing for. And use the likes of experience maps to look at all of the different things that matter in the experience. Again, working in kind of marketing, I spend a lot of time working in kind of campaigns and launches of different products and, and startups and looking at the ecosystem and looking at everything from you know, what role PR is going to play to press to, to influencers to everything. And the list of kind of um, the elements in the ecosystem goes way, way beyond these, but it's looking at actually all of these little touch points play a part in the experiences that we design. All of them will influence our end results in the end. And for us, it's really to understand what role each one actually has, how the messaging is going to work on each one, how they're going to connect, and when in that kind of journey in the narrative they're going to come into place. So with regards to the settings for the products and services that we design, it's really about getting into the details of it, really mapping and defining 
and trying to really design that environment. And it goes back again to making sure that we can create the best possible experience where all those things just seamlessly come together and you know that that little thing has an important role later on the line as well. So how then do we go from kind of being mechanics to architects? Well, the first thing is it really comes back to this whole thing. It's about asking the right questions, both from the beginning and then right in the middle of a project when working through and really defining the experiences and in the end. We heard Jared talking about the kind of pitfalls with data. And that's the problem with data, that data can tell us absolutely everything. At the same time, it can tell us absolutely nothing. One of the reasons why Fifty Shades of Grey became so kind of popular was that people could read it on the Kindle, so that would be the left-hand side, instead of blatantly reading kind of soft porn on public kind of transport. And those are the things that we need to consider, you know. It might not be that Fifty Shades of Grey is a really great book. It might just be that people can read it on a device that we can kind of let them kind of, you know, hide that they're actually reading it. It's those little nuances that we need to get under the hood with and we can't get through just measuring kind of quantitative, quantitative data. So instead, it's about really digging into the kind of context and really digging into the context of a specific kind of user and a specific user's journey, that kind of backstory to why they are here at the moment, not just what they need from our products and service right now, but how everything that's happened before actually influences what's gonna happen now and what's gonna happen in the future. But as Gerald was talking about, again, it really requires that we're working together. And this, I've left out so many different things on, on these slides in terms of different disciplines and parts of the business. But it's so crucial that we work together and that we iteratively kind of look at the different things that we want to kind of work through and define. And that marketing is not spending the time promoting something that doesn't really actually work in terms of experience. It isn't actually relevant, as we've heard before, about actually measuring as well. In the end, it should really be about making sure that every single part of the organization, in some way or another, you break down these kind of silos and everyone is telling the same story. Everyone is telling the same story in terms of who the users are, the different actors are, and what their role is, what those typical journeys are, those kind of subplots to the storyline as well, at different points and how they will input different things. And then understand what the ecosystem looked like. So even if you're working on a CRM program or you're working on, on packaging of something, you know how that's going to fit with everything else they are communicating as well. And hopefully that means that you have this kind of red thread that runs through it all and that connects every single part of the business. If we manage to do that, then that puts us in a situation where we can go back and we can look at both kind of combining qualitative and quantitative data, look at the little things we know, for example, best practices, but also look at kind of stats and comparatives. So we can really think through and from the beginning start to define things that make, make the design decision process so much easier that we can then from the beginning say, okay, for example, showing kind of related products that you can buy to kind of create an outfit. What will that do? It will enable us to set much better and much more informed hypotheses rather than just having 20, 30 hypotheses that we're just randomly scattering out and working through and trying to test, but being really, really clear and really, really informed. And along with that, making sure we set the right KPIs and that we measure it in the right possible way and have the right data and don't just stop as the first kind of assumptions. Storytelling, though, is without a doubt a buzzword. There's no denying that. But it's important to remember when you talk about kind of storytelling in design, that there has always been a part in a role for storytelling in our lives. Long before the written word was even invented, we would tell stories about the stars and the moons, gods and mythology, and it was our primary way of passing along information. However we create a story, however we tell a story, there's always an element of magic involved, where they capture our imagination, has that ability to show us something new, something we might not actually have seen before but it actually has a profound impact on how we process information as well. Studies have begun, to be, have begun to be carried out where you look at the persuasive effect of stories. And the thing that they found is that when we just read dry factual stats, we read with our guards up, we're kind of skeptical and critical, but when we're absorbed in a story, we lower our guards, we connect emotionally. And that emotional connection is the one that's so powerful behind kind of storytelling. 
By demonstrating authenticity, we can build the towel around specific users. We can show it what's in this for them, and we can change passive listeners and passive users to actually active participants. This is a really powerful thing to remember when it comes to our design process, whatever point in that kind of journey we are as well, because every little thing plays a part in our story. Every single thing from the way that we, we communicate in our tone of voice, to the colors that we use, to the number of graphics that we use, every single thing, animations and transitions, will create that overarching kind of feel and that emotional connection. The key doesn't just lie in the story itself, but it's around creating a world around it that the user can actually connect with emotionally. As creatures, we kind of, um, human beings, we kind of creatures of story. And if we want to change one person's mind on the whole world, it starts with once upon a design, or perhaps once upon a design. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, we are right on the money for our break. There were a couple of questions around your, your, uh, your customer journey map, but is it okay if people come to you for that yeah, yeah, afterwards? That's fine. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>